This morning we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. If you guys have your Bibles, we're going to be polishing off Matthew chapter 5. So go ahead and turn there. We're going to be starting in verse 31, and we are going to be taking it all the way to the end, all the way to verse 48. And uh, like the rest of Matthew 5, it's a really cheery passage. <laughs> this is stuff that most churches ignore, but it's, it's amazing stuff when you put it in context. If nothing else, just because you'll understand it and then you won't be so uh, frustrated by it because this has some hard, hard teachings in it. Matthew chapter 5, we all love the Sermon on the Mount, but my goodness, it makes keeping the law look easy, right? When you see the things that Jesus tells us that we need to do in here, you're like, I can't do that. And that's actually the whole point. Spoiler alert. So let's go ahead and read over the text, and then we'll get started. So starting in verse 31, it says, Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair black or white, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, for whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Easy peasy, right? No problem. <laughs> Pretty... Pretty rough passage. Hard to put this stuff into practice, right? You see it in the, the whole Sermon of the Mount. I think of the beginning of chapter 5. It was the same kind of thing, right? You know, blessed are they when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. Nobody really does that, right? We don't have crazy things happen and we're like, yes, not so much, right? But when we have that eternal perspective, that eternal mindset, and we realize God is working all these things together for good, for those who love them, for those who love him, it's easier to get like a different view of the crazy things and the hard things that happen in this life. And, uh, you know, we were talking about that last week. We were talking about that the week before because Matthew chapter 5 is kind of like the, the Christian manifesto. In the Old Testament, we had the law and in the New Testament, We've got the Sermon on the Mount, and my goodness, it's uh, it makes you long for the Ten Commandments. How you're like, that was pretty easy. That was pretty easy compared to these things. Now, Jesus just really upped the ante on us here. And uh, let's, well, let's go ahead and get started. It says, verse 31 and 32, it says, For furthermore it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. 
So if you guys know the background, there was basically like two schools. I try not to get into this stuff too much, the historical stuff, because then we turn into like an ancient history class <laughs> or a ancient literature class. But basically there was two schools and one school led by the Pharisees, they said, which is kind of random because the Pharisees usually are really into keeping the law. But the, the school of philosophy that you could divorce your wife for pretty much any reason you just had to give her a certificate of divorcement, and then you're good to go. And that was the more liberal view, which is kind of weird, since the Pharisees we usually think of as like really cut and dry. But that was the way they did it, because uh, they were keeping the law outwardly. And that's, we see that again and again with the Pharisees, right? Where they followed the letter of the law, but they threw the spirit of the law out the window. And so the other school was like, no, you can only do it for, you can only divorce for sexual immorality, for adultery. And that's basically what Jesus is saying. Jesus is like, yeah, it's only for adultery. And if you read in another place, Jesus is like, actually, you shouldn't even divorce for adultery. It's just because the hardness of our own hearts. But he does give that allowance. He's like, okay. And you're like, why is God so strict about divorce? Well, God hates divorce because he loves people. <laughs> And uh, if you love people, you're going to hate divorce because I think we all know people who've uh, gone through divorce and their kids growing up. I know I had friends whose who's, uh, parents got divorced and they had two Christmases and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And they liked getting the presents, but they would have way rather had their parents be together. You know, at the end of the day, it makes a kid feel like, well, I guess I was kind of a mistake, right? Since that marriage didn't work out and that's tragic. It's not the case at all, but you get that feeling in your heart from people that I've talked to that have been, that have been raised in a divorced family. And sometimes the kids from the previous marriage just totally get thrown to the wayside and a new family starts and they're just like, <laughs> like the fifth wheel. It's tragic, but God hates divorce because he loves people. And the Bible tells us that in marriage two become one. So it's like gluing two pieces of paper together and then trying to tear them apart. You ever tried to do that? Like glue, glue two pieces of paper together and wait till it dries and then like try to separate them? Pretty messy, right? Doesn't work so well. You know, and I get it. There are times that it's out of your control. You know, sometimes, you know, the Bible talks about it. If the unbelieving person wants to depart, let them depart. What can you do? You can't force someone to stay married to you. So sometimes it's out of your control and other times, you know, especially with people that have become Christians later in life, they might have had a divorce before they were Christian. Obviously, God forgives you for that, you know, and the Bible does say if they want to leave, you got to let them leave, you know, and if you weren't a Christian, God doesn't expect unbelievers to live like Christians. And that's really one of the tragic things we see with the legalistic church where so many in America today are, are going around and trying to get everyone to live like they're Christian. I just want the Christians to live like Christians. If that happened, I would be so happy, but that's not even happening. But we're trying to make everybody else live Christian while we ourselves aren't even living like Christian very often, like Christians very often. So God doesn't expect unbelievers to live like believers. And as believers, you know, we shouldn't divorce except for the cause of adultery. You know, but there are things that are done that we regret, you know, and God can restore broken marriages just as he can restore broken people. You know, whether they've been divorced or whether, you know, they're considering divorce or any of these kinds of things, God can fix that. And, you know, God can forgive people who have divorced for unbiblical reasons, just like he forgives other sins. You know, God is a God of restoration and second chances. And so, you know, praise God for that. Uh, let's take a look at verses 33 through 37. It says, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king, nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. Even if you think you can, it's still growing out gray. <laughs> but let your yes be yes and no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Of all the things lacking, you know, in the body of Christ today, I think probably the most wanting is integrity. You know, we're no longer 
the average man is no longer a man of his word. You know, back in the day, they didn't have contracts for the most part. People would shake hands, you know, and a man's word was his bond and you could take it to the bank, right? If a man said he would do something, or a woman, of course, they, they would do it, you know? And that's actually one of the things that contributes to the problem of divorce, right? Because when we get married, we say, till death do us part in sickness and in health, right? All these things, we make these promises, but since we're lacking in integrity, we're like, yeah, what I just, I think of what it was like Kanye West and Kim Kardashian, they got divorced a couple months ago. I don't know how the media didn't pick up on that very much, but I didn't, I don't watch TV. So I didn't see it in the news I watch, but they're supposed to be Christian, right? They go to church every Sunday. Irreconcilable differences. What? Yeah, we're people. We're humans. We suck. Like, that's, that's how it works. <laughs> Marriage is tough. <laughs> you know what's even tougher? Divorce. You know, <laughs> it's not an easy thing. And now they, they've done that, and that's what the world looks at and says, oh, I guess it's okay. They did it, and they're Christian. People are no longer, uh, no, people no longer have integrity. They no longer have character. In Psalm 15, you guys can turn there if you've got your Bibles. Psalm chapter 15, it's a good, it's a good passage. Verses 1 through 4. You don't have to turn there, but you can if you want. Oh, hit Job, went too far. Psalm chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, it says, Lord, this is a Psalm of David, it says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle, like your temple? who may dwell in your holy hill. He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart, who does not backbite, backbite with the tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor does he take up a reproach against his friend, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, but he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Imagine swearing to your own hurt and not changing. How often do we do that as Christians? Where we say something that we're going to do something and then, you know, we didn't have a complete understanding of the situation or what have you. And we're like, wow, I just bit off a lot more than I can chew. And most of the time, pretty much all the time, people are just like, yeah, I know I said I was going to do that, but I'm not going to do it. We don't have integrity anymore. You know, today people are looking for any reason to break their word, to get out of doing what they said they would do. I remember I had a situation with a, with a dear brother who's one of my closest friends, and he was in ministry as well, and he falsely accused me of something, and... Uh, Tried up, down, left, right to explain it to him. Didn't want to hear it. And he used that false accusation to basically break, like I counted out seven promises that he had made <laughs> that he broke based on one false accusation. Like, even if I did that, even if I did what he falsely accused me of, like, shouldn't we keep the word that we made to the Lord? Shouldn't we honor the thing that we said that we would do? Right? Right? even to our own hurt? Do we repay evil for evil? If someone pokes us in the chest, do we punch them in the face? You know, that's like the, all too often. <laughs> Don't answer that. But, you know, we shouldn't, right? We shouldn't do those things. And we often do in the body of Christ without even a second thought, right? We don't even have a second thought. We repay evil for evil. Well, they did this, so it's okay that I do that. The legendary Christian theologian J. Edwin Orr, in his book, Full Surrender, he points out that failing to do what we've said that we would do, especially in the context of God, in the Christian context, it's one of the things that grieves the Holy Spirit and leads to spiritual impotence. And looking around the body of Christ today, see a lot of that, don't we? See a lot of people that are grieving the Holy Spirit and the church is just getting walked all over just because like we talked about last week, I think it was where the salt loses its saltiness. And then what's it good for? Being trampled underfoot. Sounds like the church today, huh? Being trampled underfoot. Because we're no different than the world. 
We want God to bless us, but all too often we live lives that God can't bless. You know, I, I'm sure as parents, we've all had this situation where we've like, you know, got some fun thing planned or some little, you know, little tchotchke that we want to give the kids. And then they do something bad and you're just like, I'm going to save that for a couple weeks now. They just blew it big time and they're not getting that, that, you know, vacation that we had planned or that toy that I had, you know, as a parent, we know what, we know what I mean. And it's the same with God. You think God's going to be like, all right, I'm going to shower you with blessings when you're totally living a life that's antithetical to him. What do, what do unbelievers hate about the church? It's full of hypocrites, right? And isn't that the core of hypocrisy? When we're living out lives and lacking integrity? I think of Chuck Missler. You guys might know who he is. He was a famous pastor. And he was a, he was a CEO of like Texas Instruments. We all know what that is, like right? the calculator company, tech company. And Western Digital, the hard drive makers. He was a CEO of those companies. Like tippy top of the corporate world bunch of other defense contractors and all that kind of stuff. And when he left ministry and went to Calvary Chapel, uh, left the corporate world and went to Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa and was one of the assistant pastors for Chuck Smith. And he was doing the Wednesday nights. He was there for like, you know, 20 years or something. And he would often lament about how in the corporate world, a bunch of unbelievers were more trustworthy and more reliable than the Christians he met in the in ministry. You know, in the corporate world, you know, you'd shake hands. It was a deal. They would do it. And these guys weren't even Christians. And then he went into the Christian world and the mentality was like, yeah, sue me. Like, Wait, what? And the world sees that, right? You think that's attractive to the world? Like, oh, I want what you have. <laughs> yeah, not so much, huh? We lack integrity. And when we lack integrity, we're not euthetos, which is fit for service or I guess technically it's youth toss. But God can't use us. God can't do the things that he wants to do. God can't bless us in the way that he wants to bless us if we're living lives that are contradictory to the teachings of the word of God. And it's epidemic today. It's rampant. Take a look at verses 38 through 42. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak too. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. So where in verse 41, it talks about compels you to go one mile, go with him too. The Roman centurions, they could like, you know, lay their hand on your shoulder and be like, Help me with my pack. And by Roman law, if you weren't a citizen, you would have to go with them one mile. And Jesus is like, go with them too. Go the extra mile. You know, we, we talk in Christianity, we talk Christianese, right? We say, oh, I want to have a servant's heart, brother. You guys have all heard that, right? I want to have a servant's heart. And the test is, how do we respond when we're treated like a servant? Do servants talk back, right? Do servants have a will of their own? Do servants argue? If you're a servant and your master did something you didn't like, or your fellow servant even, would you repay evil for evil? Wouldn't go very well for you if you did, right? What did Jesus do? Did Jesus repay evil for evil, or did he overcome evil with good? What's the world tell us to do? Revenge is a dish best served cold, right? That's the, that's the world's mentality, right? But what did Jesus do? He was gracious, forgiving, merciful, long-suffering, all of these things. And if we're his followers, we should be too, right? Radically different. My wife, when she came, she wasn't my wife. I did missionary dating. Don't ever do that, kids. But when I first met my wife, she was a militant atheist, and she was, she's like, I really like this guy, but he's Christian. Darn, he must be crazy because she's from France. So they look at Christians kind of like the way that we look in people that are in Scientology or something. You're like, oh, crazy people. That's pretty much how France looks at Christians or Muslims or any religious people at all. They think religion is like for crazy people. 
But when she met Christians, she's like, these people are so different. They're happy. I want what they have. And you know what the tragedy is? Nowadays, the church is bending over backwards to try to be just like the world, right? You look at like Hillsong and Elevation Worship with like these hipster pastors and they're all tatted up and they're just like, hey, what's up, guys? And you're just like, what are you supposed to be? It's, it's crazy. It's bizarre. We want to be just like the world. The only problem is I don't, I don't find that anywhere in the pages of Scripture. I don't find a comfortable Christianity or a, a worldly Christianity anywhere in the pages of Scripture. Maybe in the letter to the, the letters to the seven churches, the church of Laodicea. But that's not where you want to identify. That is not a good place to be. But to love when you're hated, that's hard. Right? It's unnatural. But doing that can open the eyes of the spiritually blind people. I was reading one of the books put out by the voice, the voice of the martyrs. And it was talking about, I can't remember if it was volume one or volume two. It was talking about, I think it was Cambodia. And there was a Christian family about the age of my family. You know, they had kids, young kids. And they were about to be executed. And uh, they were at the edge of like a clearing and behind them was like the jungle and the soldiers were there and they were getting ready to execute them. And the, the oldest child, I think it was probably about the age of my oldest boy, probably about nine or 10 years old. He got up and he ran off into the jungle and the soldiers were about to follow him and chase him into the jungle. And the father said, no, wait, hold on, please let me talk to him. I'll bring him back. And so the father called out into the jungle and said, son, now think about eternity. Think about what you're doing. You know, give him basically the, this life is a test talk, you know. And his son came back. And they were all executed together as a family. But right before that happened, one of the soldiers said, I want to be a Christian too. And he died with them. You know, in the Chinese underground church, we hear a lot about the, the Uyghur Muslim population in China, right? How they're being tortured in concentration camps, and they are. But what they don't mention is, so are the house church Christians. We're right there too, removing our organs without anesthesia. They're doing all that crazy stuff, selling them to people on the black market. Oh yeah, you want to wait three years in America for a kidney transplant? You can go get one in China tomorrow. Those aren't magical organs, kids. Those are coming from Christians and Muslims. And the Chinese underground church, they literally do rejoice when they come under suffering. You know why? Because they look at this life as the kingdom of preparation. And we look at this life as the kingdom of inheritance. But that's the next life. The next life is the kingdom of inheritance. You listen to Copeland and you know Osteen and all these TV preachers, they would convince you that it's your best life now and every day of Friday. That's the name of their books. <laughs> your best life now? Like, what Bible are you reading? I've never seen that in the Bible. The Bible teaches this life is a test. And what we do in this life determines our eternity. But so often we want to have our cake and eat it too, right? We want, it, we want to live this life and be rich and have everything great and just ignore that the world is burning around, burning down around us. And all too often that mentality is to repay evil for evil. To get revenge. The Bible says, God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Who do you think is going to do a better job? <laughs> you or God? That's a tough thing though, right? And to be clear, I don't think this is so much applying towards interpersonal relationships with people that we're close to. Although I would absolutely say that this, uh, I wouldn't say that this doesn't apply. I'm just saying the context here, if you read the context, right? 
It's talking about the evil person, the person who's hostile to you, right? The person who's slapping you, the person. Hopefully that's not your interpersonal relationship. If it is, find new friends. What's the old joke? You can, you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your family members. So sometimes I get it. I think of, you know, we all have family members that are like, yeah. But the context here is an evil person, a person that you're not friends with. And obviously common sense applies, you know, as husbands, we have biblical obligations to protect our families, right? So is this saying I shouldn't try to protect my family? Not at all, right? Uh, biblical obligations in society for society to protect the people, right? Does this mean the government shouldn't punish evil people? No, that's not what this is talking about at all, right? This isn't saying like, give away all your family's food so your children starve or don't protect your kids, you know? No, no, that's not what this is saying. You know, it's not, it's not in that context. The context is when we're trying to relate to those outside of the body of Christ, we want to be radically different. Instead of repaying evil for evil, like we see in Islam and Mormonism and these other things. See, I researched the early history of Mormonism. Definitely, we're not turning the other cheek. There's armed wars fought between. It's a whole other topic. But this is this, when you think of, you know, turning the other cheek, do you think of Islam? <laughs> not so much, right? Not so much. As Christians, you know, our radical unheard of love should be shown in the face of persecution. And that's one of our most powerful witnessing tools, how we suffer. How do we respond when we get that, that cancer diagnosis, you know, or when someone lights us up and just starts cursing us out or what have you? Do we repay evil for evil? Do we shake our fist at God or, or lash out at our fellow man? If you do, you just compromise your witness and nobody cares what you say about Jesus anymore, huh? And I used to fight. I grew up fighting. <laughs> so this is a completely different mindset than the one that I embraced for most of my life. But you can't argue the facts. And the facts are that historically, the gospel of Jesus Christ always spreads uncontrollably, uncontrollably when watered by the blood of the saints. And that's hard. That's hard. But imagine if instead of being known for being judgmental and hypocritical and unloving and phony and all these other labels that people think of when they think of the church. Imagine if instead the church was known for being self-sacrificial and loving, you know, and caring and authentic. You know, all the things that uh, Jesus were, was known for. Imagine if we were known for that. What's the old joke? They, the unbelievers always joke and say, oh, Jesus, I love Jesus, but his followers, man. And all too often it's true, right? Imagine if we went the extra mile with people, not to convince people that we're good Christians, but because our love for Jesus compels us. We realize how much he's done for us. Take a look at verses 43 through 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Yeah. 
No problem, right? How on earth, <laughs> how on earth are we going to do that? Makes you miss the Ten Commandments, huh? You're like, <laughs> I could not kill them. That's easy. But to love them, man, that's a tall order. Here's the reality, though. The reality is it's hard to hate someone you're praying for, right? If you're praying for someone every day or, you know, as much as you can, it's hard to hate that person. And here Jesus commands us to pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. And it's hard for people to hate someone who's constantly blessing them in doing good to them. I hate it, but it's true, right? Kill them with kindness, right? It works. If you're loving someone, if you're gracious to someone, if you're forgiving to someone, if you're trying to bless someone who doesn't like you, it's going to take a lot of the wind out of their sails. Isn't that what God does for us? Do we see like a giant finger just coming down from heaven? A lightning bolt, like, run away, that person just did something stupid. That's what God does for us, right? He makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends his rain on the just and the unjust. We hate rain, but rain was actually good in ancient times. You needed it to water the plants and that kind of stuff. So this was actually like a good thing. This was like, he rains on them. Ha <laughs> ha. No, rain was good back then. The Bible tells us in Romans 2, 4, that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. You wouldn't notice that from the way some Christians treat people, right? Churn or burn. God hates fags. You're going to hell, right? How We see that. It's on TV, right? We see it all the time. You know why it's on TV? Because that makes everybody hate Christians. And the devil runs this world right now. The Bible says that. He's the prince. He's the, the god of this world right now. He's the usurper, right? When Adam rebelled against God in the garden, he gave him the title deed to earth. That's what Revelation's all about. Who was worthy to open the scroll? Nobody had to be a man. And then John looks and he sees the lamb as it was slain. The lion of the tribe of Judah. He was worthy because he was fully man and fully God. He lived the perfect life. Adam blew it. Jesus could open the scroll and take it back from Satan. And Jesus, what was he like? He was kind. People like Jesus, right? Even people that aren't Christians are like, yeah, Jesus, Jesus is cool, man. Because he was nice. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. We love him because he first loved us. And as Christians, we should be showing people God's love for them. We're his ambassadors. What's the ambassador do? Whatever he wants? No, he gives the message from the king to whoever he's been sent to. And that's us, right? We're the ambassadors pleading with men, be reconciled to God, the Bible tells us. All too often, we're like, man, I hope God judges those, you know, insert whatever here. I hope God judges those people. We should be praying that God saves those people. That was us before we came to Christ. You know, Paul's talking about all the things that we once were. He's like homosexuals and, and thieves and liars and murderers. He's like, all su such were some of you. But you were washed, you were cleansed, you were sanctified. But as we've seen here in chapter 5, man, doing this stuff is not easy. Makes keeping the law look easy, right? And in that sense, this list almost condemns us through our inability to keep these things. How do we do these things? And that's not by chance. That's the whole point. We can't do these things unless we're clothed in Christ. That's Christianese. <laughs> unless we're walking in the Spirit. <clears throat> that's more Christianese, right? The Bible says, walk in the Spirit and you won't fulfill the deeds of the flesh. I think it's Galatians 5.16. But how do we do that? How do we practically do that? I've used the, the story. I've heard it before, and it was a good one. So I was like, I'm using that. And it's the story of two dogs. And there's two dogs, and they're fighting. Which dog wins? The one you feed, right? 
So if you feed the flesh, or scientifically talking, if you establish those neural pathways and constantly do those things, it get easier and easier to do every time, huh? But if you feed the Spirit and do the things you know you should be doing, reading your Bible, praying, going to church, all these kinds of things, then you establish those neural pathways, it becomes easier to do that, huh? It gets easier to not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Baby steps, right? Baby steps. So if we want to put this into practice, guys, if we want to live this out, and most don't, I get it, most people don't, they're like, yeah, I got saved, I'm pretty much just going to go watch TV now, thank you. But if we do want to live sold out lives for Jesus Christ, then we need to reckon the old man dead. That's Christianese for basically saying, recognize that we're dead in Christ. That our lives are no longer our own. We were bought with a price, the Bible tells us. We're new creations in Christ. Jesus is wearing the shirt today. I was like, it's so perfect. Flipping your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I think it's uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, Galatians, I think. I think. I've forgotten more than I know. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I forgot First and Second Corinthians. After First and Second Corinthians, then it should be Galatians. Yeah. Look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. And this should be like our life verse. It's Paul speaking through the Holy Spirit. And he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Our lives are no longer our own. Everybody's like, I'll die for Jesus. He just wants you to live for him, man. If you're not willing to live for him, you're probably not going to be willing to die for him. But he died for us, so the least we could do would be to live for him. Imagine how different our lives would be, our world would be, if instead of trying to keep as much of the old life as possible, we tried to leave the old life as much as possible. Nowadays, it seems like it's a competition, and you see it with a lot of the trendy churches, to see how much like the world we can be. You know, we can bring in this, and we've got the fog machines and lasers, and, you know, youth group's going to have pizza, and it's going to be really fun. We might mention one or two Bible verses, but our main goal is just to make sure you feel really good so you come back next week and throw a little bit of money in the box. Imagine if it was the opposite and our goal was to try to live as much as we could sold out for Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, like, like we see in the Bible. You see it all the time in our world where it's like, I'm a Christian rapper now. You're like, why, why not just be dead in Christ? And I pick on that because I grew up in that culture. You know, I grew up in Gladiator School of Southern California where it was like, it was all bad. But we try to live as much as we can like the world. We try to, you know, see how close to that line that we can get. I look at, I look at that, it's, it's like Christian rap, for instance. I look at it like Nicorette. Nicorette's good, right? It's better than smoking cigarettes. Sure. But would you ever be like, hey, you should try some Nicorette if you don't smoke? Like, what, what do you, what, what, no? I, I just want to be like Jesus. I want to be righteous. I don't want to be like a Christian version of my old self. Does that sound like you're dead? You know, he never talks about like, we talk about it, it's Christianese, but it's not biblical, renewing our hearts. No, he doesn't renew our hearts. Our hearts are desperately wicked. He gives us new ones, not like a Christian version of the old one. 
like a, be like a saint. I'm, I'm a Christian prostitute. I'm a Christian murderer. Like, <laughs> no, you're just not a murderer anymore. But now the world wants to be as much as it can. The Christian world wants to be as much as it can like the carnal world. It's weird. I don't get it. Going back to my wife, what, what she liked was that it was different. And now it's not so different, huh? Now it's just like the world. Oh yeah, you can still do all that stuff and be a Christian. It's like fire insurance now. I, I said the little prayer. I checked the little box. I'm good to go now. Is that the whole idea of verse 48? Take a look at verse 48 again. Look what it says here. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. <laughs> yeah. The good news here is that the word here is hagios. I mean, it's not hagios. Hagios is like the traditional version of holy as we think of like, like sacred. That's like hagios. That's the traditional version. It's not that one. It's actually teleos. Remember teleological? We were talking about teleological ethics and deontological ethics. Yeah. Teleos is different. It's not like the set apart holy version of a sacred version of the word holy. It's like the complete mature, like having reached its end, fully developed. So we would think of this as like mature, complete. And if we want to be fully developed, con complete, mature Christians and be used by God, that concept of euthetos, fit for service. If we want to be that, then we need to put these things into practice. We need to be men of our words, right? We need to, uh, we need to bless those who curse us and do good to those who hate us. And pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. And if we don't, sure, you can you can make it into heaven. You guys can. You can you can have that Hillsong elevation Christianity, and you can you know the Stephen Furtick Christianity, the Joel Osteen Christianity. You can do that and go to heaven. You can. You'll regret it, but you can do that. But I would be remiss if I didn't point out that heaven's not a place of equality. You're supposed to gasp, like, what? No, heaven's not a place of equality. Uh, the Bible, I think of Daniel 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars in the firmament. That means those who don't, won't, right? There's crowns you can get. Five crowns that we know of that are described in the New Testament. Some people, some of those crowns, all of us will get if we're really Christian. Other ones we won't. Heaven's not a place of equality. We're all equally saved. All of our cups are equally full of joy. But some of us have bigger cups than others. And how big your cup is depends on how you lived your Christian life. If you just get saved and then you know, go sit back and watch the Broncos every weekend and, you know, go shooting and fishing and all that stuff that I love to do. If that's what your life is, if that's where your heart is, don't expect to have the same eternity as the person who burned down their life around Jesus and went out into the mission fields and died for Christ or what have you. I used to explain it to one of my friends this way. It'd be like going down to the seashore and picking up a grain of sand. And then thinking, okay, this is this life and this is eternity, all the rest of this sand. What do I want to do? Which one do I want to be the good one? In Christianity today, 99.9% .9 of the people are like, huh, this one, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's bizarre. It makes me wonder, do we really believe what's written in this book? Because if we did, wouldn't we live radically different lives? I use the example of like a vacation. Imagine if I was like, all right. I'll offer you two choices between a vacation here. One of them is like a first class trip on like a private jet with like the best catering, everything like your own private cabin, but you're going to Detroit <laughs> forever. <laughs> and the other one is you're riding coach between a crying baby and a fat stinky guy, but you're going to Maui. Which one would you guys pick? Probably Maui, right? Yeah, everyone's picking Detroit. Look around. Everyone's picking Detroit. Because it's like in the Matrix. You ever seen the Matrix movie? And he's like eating the steak after he betrays them. And he's like, 
I know this isn't real, but it tastes so good. And that's what this life is. We're all living in illusion. We're here in this electron particle simulation where, you know, this is 99.99% empty matter, just molecules vibrating around electrons. And all. This is a particle simulation. You can look at the pixelization of the universe. It proves that. You can look at how the role of the observer changes reality. We're in a simulation here. It's not a computer simulation. It's an electron particle simulation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the spirit vibrated, hovered over the waters. And here we are in this test that looks so real that pretty much everyone forgets it's a test. Pretty cool, right? It's a pretty good test. And we all go about our lives doing our own thing. But if we want to be used by God to the fullest, guys, this is the life that we have to live. We have to take every thought captive. We have to remember that this is a test. And if you do these things, God will use you in a crazy way. He's got such amazing plans for each one of you guys. Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel, he was my pastor. I grew up there and he used to always say, only one life and soon it's past and only what we've done for Christ will last. Pretty cool, huh? Let's pray. Father God, please help us to put these things into practice in our lives. Lord, help us to be hearers of the word and not just doers. Help us to love our enemies. Help us to pray for those who use us and abuse us. Help us to be gracious and forgiving. Just like you were, Jesus. And Lord, convict us of the things in our lives that we need to change. So that you can use us to build your kingdom on this earth. We know you're coming again soon. Lord, help us to occupy till you come. Use us to build your kingdom. And bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now. In Jesus' name. Thank you.